So I'm going to take an example from the textbook to show you how a decoder would overcome the errors in a system. So this is based on that first decoder that I built. I assumed that I had a certain received sequence and I introduced all of the branch metrics. And from those branch metrics, how do we get to the situation where we had two choices? I gave you something very simple. Here's two paths. But how do we get to that point? Well, we do it systematically, step by step. I assume I started at state A. I could have gone to state A or gone down to state B. I calculate the branch metrics, and the path metrics are the same thing here. It's easy. Um, next case also, uh, now there are four possible states at the end of time three, but again, each one of them only has one possible path coming into them, so there's no ambiguity here. And again, I can calculate what are the path metrics. If I arrive here, it's going to be 2 plus 1, it gives me 3. So I can build my path metrics for this case. Now I get to where things start getting interesting, because now when I get to time 4, now I've got uh, two paths coming into each one of the states. So I'm going to have two candidate paths on each one of the states. And so I'm going to have to do this evaluation of the path metric to choose what is the surviving path. So I go through and I focus now on one endpoint. You know, sure I've got three, four states I have to address, but let's just look at the first one. Let, where does this come from? What, is it the one that came from above or the one that came from below that got me to this path if at time four I really am at state A? So along the upper path, I calculate a path metric of 4, and along the lower path, I have a path metric of 3. Okay, so I compare 4 and 3, and I say 3 is smaller. So I prune my path. What I mean by prune my path is this part of the transition I get rid of entirely. It's like it didn't exist. So when I look here at my survive path, there's just one that I keep. The other ones I get rid of. Now, I did that for the first one. The losing path is removed. We take the gardening analogy again. It's a trellis. It's a garden. I'm pruning. I'm cutting out the part that I don't need. Now I go down to the next state. Now I just go down to B. Now I just ask the same questions. To get to B, did I come from the lower path or the upper path? And so I calculate the distances for each one. Upper path, distance 4. Lower path, distance 3. Once again, I choose the lower path. And so once again, I eliminate the uh, path that, that lost. I prune it away. And so you'll see that coming into here, there's nothing there from that path. I go down to the next one. Oh, let's go back. Okay, one point, one interesting point is, uh, if I look back at my uh, pruned paths, if I look back at my pruned paths, I didn't go through all of the... Um, examples, but uh, leave that as an exercise. You can do the same calculation for C and D, and, and you will get this result. These are the pruned paths going up to time four. So having gotten to time four with these four possible paths, what conclusions can I draw from having reached this point? So the first thing I want you to observe is that all four of these paths have a common element here between time one and time two. This transition, everybody agrees with. Whether at time four I think I'm at state A or I think I'm at state D, I am sure that when I was here at this, this transition was a zero. We call that a merge. And at a merge, that means that I can output a decision. When I get a merge, I don't know at time four which one of these maybe I'm at. But I know that at time one what it was. So now I can output this from my decoder, and I can continue on until I get another merge where I can kick one out and, and make decisions. So there's a delay involved in doing the decoding process because I have to see the dependencies develop with time. And as I see the development with time, there's going to be some natural decisions which are kicked out. Now, sometimes I can't tolerate too much delay, or maybe this delay will go on forever. The other thing is, I have memory, and I have to save all of these paths as I step through time. And maybe I have a finite amount of memory. And after a certain amount of time, even if there's not a merge, 
maybe I have to make a decision anyway. So I run out of memory and I have to decide, you know, which of these two are going to be the decision. So then what I would do is look at the, the paths and see which one's more likely. But, but for now, the idea is that there's a certain length that as a designer, I can say, there's a certain what we call a traceback length. And after that traceback length is exceeded, I'm running out of memory. I have to make a decision now because I can't keep this old part of the path. Uh, so we can make this as a compromise. We want it to be long enough so that uh, we won't have to force merge very often. Or when we do force it, it will be so deep back that it's going to be pretty obvious what it should be. Or uh, we have to tolerate the uh, added memory uh, requirement. But anyway, engineering choice, traceback length. So let's uh, continue in our example just to hit a place where things become a little ambiguous. For instance, now let's say I'm looking at state B at time 5. Well, first of all, there is some efficiency that I can use in the algorithm. For one thing, when I get to this point, and I'm looking at the um, upper path, I don't have to look at 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus 0 and do the whole calculation of the whole path metric again. What I do in my algorithm is, when I get to a certain point, I've already calculated the length of the path. I save that. In memory, I put two things. For state A at time 4, the path was this. And secondly, the length of the path was 3. So I start thinking about what is it in the complexity of this decoder. Well, the complexity of the decoder is each one of the states I have to keep the path that got there. You know, I always have you know, four paths, one for each one of the states. So that's a sequence of bits. And the length of that sequence is the traceback length that I, that I said. And I also have to keep the, the path metric. So why is it good to keep the path metric? Because now, in the next interval of time, I don't have to go back and recalculate it. The upper path at T5 comes from T4. And so T4, the path up to that point, at, at state A was 3, and so I just add 3 and 1, and I get 4. The lower path uh, came from state C, which had length of 0, and for that uh, I can see that the total length now is 1. I'm sorry, I was pointing at uh, state A, and I should have been talking about state B, my mistake. So uh, state B, the upper path, also came from state A. Sorry about that. So I'm at state B. I'm wondering about the two paths. And I say, well, the upper path came from state A. State A had a path length of 3. Now the transition from A to B has a branch metric of 1. So the new path metric will be the sum of the old path metric plus 1, which gives me 4. The lower path came from uh, state um, C. So I look at state C, what the length was. It was 0, I add 1, I get 1. So now I don't have to go through and do the entire path length calculation. I just need the delta. Previous path metric plus new branch metric gives me new path metric. And again, I compare 4 and 1. Clearly, the lower one is smaller. I keep the lower one, and I prune out the higher one. Now let's look what happens on this particular example when we're looking at state C at time 5. And at state C, we have two possibilities. The upper path has a branch metric of 0. The lower path has a branch metric of 1. And the upper path came from state B. Uh, the lower path. We're going to do the lower path first. The lower path came from state D. And it had a length of 2. And I'm adding 1 to it. It gives me 3. If I look at the upper path, it came from state B, and that had a length of 3, and now I add 0 as my branch metric, I get 3, 3 and 3. Okay, now what do I do? Well, they're both the same. Which one do I keep? Completely arbitrary choice. Take a coin and flip it. Doesn't matter. Later on, it won't be better. You know, you're always going to say they're both equal length. It will never be useful to you to keep those two paths, because you will never be able to choose between them. So since you will never know how to choose between them, you just make the, the decision up front, toss a coin, keep one of them, and move on. 
So that brings us to the end of time six. You can go through and do the calculations as you wish, and you will find yourself at this uh, final point at time six, where you have, again, always four candidate paths. If we look backwards, there's two um, paths that everybody agrees on. And then what we have now are some path metrics. Uh, so each one of those different paths has some associated number of errors. So if I ended up at state A, it's because there were two errors. If I arrive at state B, I assume there are two errors, uh, etc. And if I arrive at state D, it would have been because there was one error. So if I had to make a decision, if I was forced now to make a decision on what path is the most likely path, I would choose the path with the smallest path metric. And I would go back here and choose that path as the final path, uh, if you were forced. 